Hey guys, so today's video is a little bit different. I'm going to be sharing with you my thoughts on investing in oil and gas, some of my personal strategies. Now guys, just out of transparency, I do own some shares mentioned on the slides. And of course, uh, now what I say should be taken as financial advice. Hey guys, if you're interested in building a six to seven figure portfolio using the power of stock investing, head over to the comment section or the description to sign up for our free masterclass so that we share with you exactly how we do it. Okay, so today we will cover some of the important basics. Now, basics are important, right? Um, in fact, they are more important than anything else. Without the basics, you won't get some of the more difficult concepts. But what are you going to get in this video today? Number one is uh, why do we still need to care about oil and gas, right? Isn't there ESG and things like that? Uh, of course, some of the basics. And this is going to be actually a, the first part of a multiple series, first part of a series. And I'll be starting this video sharing with you my views on the upstream sector for oil and gas. Now, of course, we can't cover everything in a single video with upstream is very complicated, but you know, there's a lot of stuff going on, but uh, the focus will be on investing, which is why point number four is, I'm going to show you how I would look at the industry and what kind of companies I'm looking for when it comes to uh, EMP or upstream companies. Now, it's important for you to know that you actually do not need an expert and I'm not an expert. I think it's a bit of a myth, especially with all these highly technical uh, industries that you need to maybe be some sort of uh, expert or you went to university to study the deep engineering uh, into these industries. It's not necessary. In fact, uh, it's what I would call a non sequitur. In other words, your uh, domain knowledge right, doesn't necessarily translate into uh, investing success. So the example I always like to give is Apple. Right, uh, to build an iPhone, right? There's a lot of engineering involved. Uh, it can be quite complicated, especially with chips, um, all the fancy microchips, M1 chips, whatever chips, right? Uh, those require deep engineering. But uh, Buffett bought Apple in 2016. Do you think he knows how to engineer a chip? Uh, and yet he has made a hugely handsome profit with Apple. So I think that's more than enough proof to convince you that you do not need to be expert. What you do need to know is the basic economics behind this. Because at the end of the day, for investors, it's about the profitability, right? Going forward from today onwards, is the company going to be more profitable? Is the company going to be more, uh, or is the company going to be better off? So that's the important bit. Uh, shout out to my buddy, uh, Aaron. He uh, was very helpful in this research and he actually has a Substack. Uh, go check it out. Uh, over 3,000 people have subscribed and he, actually, he also has a paid version. Uh, the prices are going to be rising really, really soon, right? In less than a week, May the 1st. So go check it out. Okay, so why, why as, especially as Malaysians, should we really look at oil and gas? I think the first thing, uh, is if you haven't already known, we are an oil exporting nation. Now, it is not our number one export. Our number one exports actually belong to the electronic and uh, electrical and electronic uh, product sector, which is nearly 40%. But at second place, it will be the oil and gas related exports, right? So whether it's refined petroleum, LNG or gas uh, or crude. So if you add them all, or up, they are close to nearly about 17, 18, nearly 20% of our exports. So that's very, very uh, significant. So, it, you know, now what that translates to is that there, it means that there are a lot of opportunities in Malaysia for oil and gas uh, because, well, we're big in a way. Now, uh, one concern you might have is, well, should we even care about oil and gas because of ESG. And I think for sure, you know, ESG is going to affect oil and gas. But one thing you need to know is that any attempts to be more ESG, to be more carbon neutral, sometimes they use the word, uh, would mean that more fossil fuels are actually used. Now, uh, why is that the case? Wind, solar, and of course, uh, batteries to store, store all this energy actually require a lot of fossil fuel powered activities, right? 
just to give you a sense, this is from uh, Prager University. It's a pretty uh, informative YouTube channel. You can go check it out. But for every half a ton of EV battery, you need to dig up, you need to process and you know produce a 250 ton of earth and minerals. That's crazy. And all of this digging up and stuff like that requires, uh, guess what, fossil fuels, right? You use machinery to dig that up. So go figure. For wind farms, right, 100 uh, megawatt, you're looking at 80,000 ton of fossil fuel related uh, activities as well. So that's big. And with uh, the solar farm, uh, it's 150% greater, especially for cement, steel and glass, all of which require fossil fuel to produce. And all of this will result in anywhere between 200 to 2,000% of uh, increased mining for rare earth minerals. Again, all of this requires fossil fuels. So ever since, not to say ESG started, but ever since environmentalism started, um, the share right of oil-powered energy or gas, uh, sorry, fossil fuel power energy has dropped from 86% to 84%. And billions, maybe even trillions spent and nothing really has happened. 97% of all global transportation today is still oil and gas. So all this should inform you that, you know, it's not going anywhere. And therefore, uh, investment opportunities are plenty. But guys, before we move on, if you're someone looking to level up their stock investing skills and you need a lot more guidance, we do have a one-on-one -on -one program called the Mentorship Program. If you're interested, you can apply it in the comment section or the description. The area we're going to focus on today would be the upstream. So another name for upstream is called ENP. So you explore and then you produce the oil. Uh, when we think of, you know, things like platforms, oil rigs, you know, whatever picture you have in your imagination, that's usually in the upstream. The other two streams are the midstream and the downstream. So the midstream will be your refineries, your storage and things like that. Uh, and uh, sorry, apologies. It will be your pro processing and transportation and stuff like that. So if you heard of Yinsen, right, they are in F F FPSO business. They charter boats essentially to transport from maybe the ocean to the land. And then of course, the more downstream stuff would be the refining, the marketing of this. You know, this would be your petrol stations. Uh, this would be your hangarens, refining and things, things like that. So what are some of the characteristics of uh, the upstream business? There are really two, two big ones. The first is that it is very capex intensive, meaning to say uh, it requires you to spend a lot of money, much more than all the other uh streams right so um a lot of capital is required which potentially means a lot of debt is required which also means that a lot of risk is required risk taking uh, and so i would say that it is the risk riskiest area to invest but fortunately for you if you stay all the way until the end of the video i will show you a what i would believe is a much less risky way to invest in the upstream oil and gas sector now, the reason why it's very expensive and why people actually are willing to spend that much money is because it is sensitive to oil prices, which is the second point. Oil prices are very volatile. So in good times, you can really make a lot of money. Now, of course, on the flip side, when times are bad, uh, you can lose a lot of money and uh, you can lose a lot more than just money. Uh, so it's a very cyclical industry, as you probably already imagined. Um, and yeah, so some important strategies and discipline must be in place as an investor, but that will be for later on. So yeah, you know, this is a oil platform offshore, right in the ocean. Uh, as you can see, it's very, very expensive. Uh, there are two kinds of this sort of, uh, you know, call it exploration, ENP uh, buildings. You can, yeah, our machinery and equipment and all that. Uh, one they call onshore and offshore. So onshore would be the ones that you see in maybe Saudi Arabia, right? They are on land. Uh, those go for anywhere between 10 to 50 million to build. Whereas offshore ones like the one you're seeing right now in the ocean, 
uh, can go from any at, at a low of 100 million to as high as several billions, right? Uh, the costs really uh, vary depending on uh, whether it's shallow water or deep water, uh, whether, you know, what kind of equipments they're using, how far you're out in the ocean, things like that, many, many different things. And of course, the key consideration, right, as a EMP player would be how big is the oil well? Why do people spend billions digging up oil? Because the oil underneath the area that they're digging is going to be even more billions than whatever they spend. So that's the simple logic, right? Now, price sensitivity, uh, the evidence is is here. So um, from the bottoms of 2020, oil prices rallied to today, uh, about 360%, right? So you're looking at 19 17 to $19 per barrel of oil to roughly 80 today, 77. Uh, now on top, on the top here, okay, you can see that Hibiscus, which is uh, an EMP player, right, an upstream player, uh, rallied 222%. Now when you compare it to two other companies in the mid to downstream segment, which is Heng Yuan and Patron M or Patron Malaysia, uh, they only grew 37 and 65% uh, respectively. Now, you, this is also going to be true if you look at other mid to downstream players like uh, Yinsen, like Dialog, right? So these are some of the important uh, differences when it comes to price sensitivity. As you can see, very quickly, we are moving through some of these uh, industry basics and you realize I never really go into all the technical aspect, uh, what is, what, what, um, equipments do you need to use for this platform? Or that? Like, all these are fun questions to really ask. Uh, like how how is a platform or rig being built? All fun questions and definitely I think as far as general knowledge goes, you should attempt to go learn about them. But as far as an investor, right, you want to be practical, you want to be, you want to be straight to the point, right? And essentially, you want to know what are the criteria, right, to, to invest, what are the key ones. Now, uh, this is, as a disclaimer, my personal strategy when it comes to uh, investing in oil and gas, uh, it doesn't mean that it's everybody's, doesn't mean that it's the best. There are definitely uh, a lot better investors out there when it comes to ENP investing. But here are the two things that I would generally uh, focus on myself. The first is, and they are all related to management strategy. And that is that the management needs to be A, cost focus, and number two, or B, uh, ROIC uh, focus. So um, let me go into them. So the first thing, and I'll use hibiscus as an example of uh, cost focus. By the way, as you saw at the share price uh, early on here, right, they are a company that has uh, done way better than a lot of the other companies in the space. Uh, if you know, if you follow Warren Buffett, he has been uh, buying oil and gas companies also. Now, um, we're using hibiscus as an example. Um, they are very cost focused. So their basic strategy as a company is they will buy what we call um, brownfield assets. So brownfield assets are just assets that, uh, you know, platforms that have already been built by some other company, maybe it's Shell or BP or whatever, Petronas, whatever. Um, and they feel like they don't want to hold it anymore because there's maybe only five to 10 years left to dig the oil up. So they will want to get rid of it. And so as a result, they will want to sell it cheap. So someone like Hibiscus will come in and say, okay, I will buy uh, these assets that you, you don't want to hold anymore for a lot cheap. I will try to make it more efficient, more cost efficient so that I can turn a profit, right? It's basically buying a mature field and reap the last few years of the profits. And hopefully those revenue that they get will uh, you know, make them profitable, which historically has happened. So they have roughly about 20 over produce, about 20 actually, uh, producing oil wells with another maybe 10 to 15 that are either in a discovery phase or their prospects uh, or on the way. So um, as you can see Malaysia, a lot of them are in, you know, areas like Sabah, right? Uh, Kinabalu, Maine, Barton, stuff like that. They are also in Vietnam. They are also in the UK and uh, they are looking to go into Australia uh, as well. So they're all over the place and yeah, that's cool. So how, how, how do Hibiscus actually make this acquisition? How do they know like, okay, I'm going to buy this oil field versus that. Now it's not hard and fast rule, but this is the basic idea, right? So uh, I know there's a lot of numbers on the screen, but if you have to take a pause and take a read before you hear my explanation, 
And okay, so basically the magic number is 55 US dollar per barrel, right? Every time uh, they assess any fuel, it must not exceed this cost structure that they have. So uh, every, to run an oil fuel or a platform or whatnot, there are three basic considerations and two basic costs or three basic costs rather. The first is fixed cost. So this is your capex or in a uh, hibiscus case, their depreciation and amortization. So really what it is, is the amount of money you have to spend to build the thing and how you depreciate it over time, right? Very simple, fixed cost. Then the second things will be, uh, the second thing will be variable cost. Now both fixed and variable costs will be at $20 per barrel. So they're roughly about the same. And Variable costs, or sometimes we call it OPEX, would be the people, right? The engineers on board, the equipments that you are renting, uh, transport, et cetera, et cetera. So this is a variable cost. Now, the last one would not quite be a cost per se, but it's some sort of provision that they have where they have this margin of safety concept, right? Because there are things like miscalculation and maybe some other things, right? You know, geography is very complicated you know, different areas will have different conditions. So different platforms will have different equipments or even if they have the same equipments, they may not have it at the same frequency, right? Again, this is where, you know, if you really want to be an expert, you can go and find out what these differences are. But as far as an investor, this is all you need to know. So basically once uh, they have identified, right, a particular oil field, They've done their study this uh, day, meaning hibiscus, and they see that the cost to run the thing would be roughly about $55 billion, uh, sorry, 55 US dollars per barrel or less. That's when they acquire the uh, fuel. Now, the re what has resulted in this very disciplined cost strategy is that if you look at the average net margin of an upstream player, right? goes from in the bad years, they will go from negative, which is normal, to 30% when things are really, really good, right? You can go and, you know, check out these numbers yourself. But if you look at what I highlight in yellow bottom here, right? This is uh, hibiscus's net margins. And for them, it can go as high as 50 over percent. Because of this, and you don't look at just 10, 20%, like it's a little bit of money. It's really a lot bigger. Right. And so that's why they've been an outperformer. And all this is attributed to their cost strategy. All right, guys, enjoying the video so far. If the answer is yes, remember, like, comment, subscribe. And as far as comments go, if you don't like the video, do let us know as well. We always take all sorts of feedback as long as they're constructive. So that's the first one, which is being cost focused. The second one is RIC focus. So now we turn our attention to a company in the US. It used to be the largest company listed in uh, America, which is ExxonMobil. Uh, they are a historical company where you know you can go read up about their history. But the area I want to focus on is actually the Lee Raymond era. So Lee Raymond was the uh, leader at Exxon between 1999 to around 2006. And the price movement of the company was 118% compared to their three biggest competitors, Chevron, BP, and Shell, which only grew 88, 56, and 28% respectively. Now, of course, you know, in seven years, 118% doesn't seem like a super, it's still impressive, but it's not like super, it's not like two, uh, it's not like three, four, five, or 10x, right? But you have to remember these are already big lumbering companies that you know are in the more mature stage of their uh, life cycle right as a company so to grow 100 percent on a you know few hundred billion dollar uh, market cap company is truly impressive so the area i want to focus on is the lee raymond era and lee raymond is someone who is quite unique most people when you you know having read a lot of any reports hearing heard a lot of you know, things like uh, earnings call, talking to other investors. Most people in the industry, 99% are very focused on what's the earnings? What is the sales or the revenue, right? Which is normal. But someone like Lee Wei, I will recommend most investors to have the same kind of thinking as well, is they want to look at this number called a ROC or the ROIC. They're more or less the same thing. 
Uh, and essentially the ROIC is trying to figure out for every dollar I produce, how much do I actually have to spend, right? How much assets do I need to have to produce that dollar? And the higher it is, the better. And you can see historically, Exxon, from, at least from 1999 to uh, 2006, in this roughly the same period, they are around 14 to 39%. Now, as you can see, oil and gas is a very choppy industry, right? 14 to 39% is a big difference. But again, when you compare it to the other in, uh, companies in the space, Chevron, Shell, and BP, uh, they are not as good, right? So, again, I don't want, I, this session is not here to tell you, uh, like to complicate things for you so much. I want to simplify investing uh, when it comes to upstream oil and gas um, for you. Um, and that's why I reduce it to really just these two important components. If you can find a company that has, just to summarize, that has the, a survival mindset, right? That's going to be really, really good. Now, if you go back to Hibiscus, why they have a survival mindset is because they recognize that oil prices can go yo-yo right? Really, really yo-yo. And so they want to reduce their cost per barrel to as low as possible. So then today, when oil prices is at 80, the additional, call it 25 uh, US dollar per barrel of profit that they make is pure profit, right? And so they keep making this profit. And let's say even if it drops to 60, right? They're still profitable. Now, if they drop down, if the oil prices drop down to, let's say, 30 or 20 like in the past, Yes, they'll be losing money, but guess what? They've already made a lot more profit in the past to account for all these downturns. Now, let's say if you're not disciplined, let's say if your cost per barrel is 70 or even 80, that means right to have the same kind of profit, quantum, don't talk about margin, but quantum, you need oil prices, if let's say 80, you need oil prices to be at 105. And if you want the same kind of quantum, you need, the oil prices to be assuming at eighty dollars per barrel of cost, right? You need oil prices to a hundred and fi- at a hundred and fifty uh, dollars. So that's not um, that's not very smart, you know. And why? Because they're not survival focused. Companies like that, I, I won't name names, but companies like that in the EMP space are not survival focused. But someone like Hibiscus is. Now, the second thing would be discipline, right? So in order to survive, you need to have the discipline. So sometimes it's very tempting because especially when oil prices are going up, people who don't have the same kind of strict standards will just buy any different or all sorts of oil fuels, right? Whether the cost is 70, 100, 80, whatever it is. Uh, And when you look around, all your competitors doing it, and you saying, oh, I'm going to stay put, not easy. So, so far, Hibiscus has shown that they have the ability to remain disciplined. So that's really, really important. And that's the same with um, ExxonMobil as well, which leads me to the third thing, right, which is related. They're all related. Uh, Zig and others, Zach. Basically, you have to have a contrarian perspective. When the herd is moving one way, there must be something inside you as a management to say, mm, maybe I'm not going to do it. Or maybe I'm going to go the other way. So uh, ready to end. These are the three basic things to really look at. Again, it's all management focus. You can actually look at their past acquisitions for oil fuels to see whether or not uh, they have displayed this sort of discipline. Now, of course, some of them will be mistakes. Uh, Don't be so harsh to say that uh, they must get it all right. Uh, But if you get more right than wrong, I think you're in good company. So uh, thanks. This is, uh, thanks for staying all all the way until the end. This is part one of our uh, this oil and gas series. Let me know if you like the video in the comments. Let me know if there's any sort of improvements that you would like me to add in the next few parts. Always look forward to your feedback. And of course, uh, before we go, we'd like to announce to you, um, this is uh, our February numbers for our Fire Pro stock performance. But anyway, Fire Pro is, uh, if you want to know a lot of discount kind of insights that I'm sharing with you, this is just really a snippet of what we usually share to our uh, paid members. And uh, if you want to pop on the program, basically we do a lot of these um, reports uh, that are easy to digest, 10 to 15 minutes long read time. Uh, and, you know, it speeds up your investment decisions. And of course, if you're starting out, if you want a reference portfolio, we have these portfolios as well. Um, 
if you want to take a taste of it, you want to try it out, um, you know, you can enroll for free, get a free sample and, uh, you know, give you a test. Now, guys, thanks for staying all the way until the end. Um, you know, again, feedback, would really love it. Come watch some of our other videos and I'll see you in the next one.